as I, I thought about uh, kind of our closing today, I, I know that you will be certainly going on, but I will be uh, only thinking about you. Um, and that is talk about Wesley's way of salvation. And because we are United Methodists, we do have a unique understanding of that that I feel like is helpful. By and large, the Methodist Church is both an emotional and an intellectual pursuit. But we do have a problematic. We are saddled with as human beings. We are guilty about the past, either things we've done or things we didn't do. And sometimes that drags us down. And we miss the importance of the message of forgiveness. We won't forgive ourselves. We won't forgive others. And so that becomes a problem as human beings for us. We also have a dissatisfaction of where we live and where we are and what we're doing. We have all sorts of diversions to keep us uh, more content, but they just don't work. We have all the sports network, we have everything else, we have television, we have movies, but when it gets right down to it, at night when we're alone and we close our eyes, there's still that dissatisfaction that comes. And then we are anxious about the future, and if you watch the news, uh, today, you know, we've got five wars going on at the same time. We have strife and bombing and so forth. We never know what's going to happen. We have to be more vigilant than ever before. And all, it is just frightening to think about the future. And the other thing is that we are basically hostile to ourselves and others. And if you don't believe that, just get out on George Bush Freeway and go somewhere. <laughs> I, I had a friend that moved way up north somewhere, and, and I saw him months later, and I said, how's it going? He said, I hate it. He said, what's wrong? He said, I can't stand the people. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yeah, if we play bridge on Friday night, and everybody concentrates on the game, and don't say too much, I can get along with them for three or four hours. Now, that's hostility. <laughs> And we tend to be basically hostile. We, we're afraid to let people close to us. We're afraid of what might happen if that happens. And so we have those problems that we have to address. But we have the scripture. That's ours. And we have that eternal question that we ask, what must I do to be saved? Now, the word salvation is an interesting word. It, the root word is salvos. It's a Greek word that means what you do when a rope is broken, you frack it up. It means healing. It, it, it refers to that fact that take something broken and make it work and make it better. Salvos. So when you talk about what must I do to be saved, you can also say what must I do to be healed. And the scripture is beautiful in that sense, except Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and you'll be saved. But then there's a parenting aspect to it. And that is, you will convey that to your whole household. When you accept Christ as your Savior, your whole household tends to accept Christ as their Savior. Now, I want to talk about Wesley's way of salvation, but we've got to go through Luther to get there, because that's the, the Reformation, and, and that's really what got us churning on this idea. You see, you have to know something about Luther. Luther was in law school, but he was afraid. He was guilty. He was depressed. He was afraid of what was going to happen. He thought he was going to be drug him down hell any minute, and so he was just led a terribly anxious life. And one day he was walking across the commons of the law school and a lightning bolt hit a tree real close to him, right next to him. Wham! Bark and mud and everything flew all over him. He fell down on his face and started screaming, Oh God, oh monk, oh monk, oh monk! <laughs> so he went into the monastery. Well, when you go into the monastery, you are assigned a father confessor. 
And this poor soul that was assigned to Martin Luther had his job cut out for him. <laughs> because Luther spent, would keep him in the confessional for hours. And he would start to leave and he'd say, oh, I forgot something. He'd go back and start confessing some more. And finally his father confessor says, Luther, why don't you do something that's worth confessing? This is boring. You're killing me with this. Go out and do something worth telling about. <laughs> then he made one more suggestion. And that is, why don't you, is that a good idea? Why don't you go do a doctorate in New Testament? And he knew that would get him out. <laughs> and so he did. Well, while he's in his studies, he's in a room with all of the scriptures and everything, and then he notices a bunch of dusty manuscripts that were never used. And they weren't used until Luther brought them forward. And that is the Pauline letters, Matthew, you know, the, First, Second Corinthians, Ephesians, and so forth, and the Book of Romans. And Luther started pulling those down, and he started reading the Book of Romans. And all of a sudden, it was just like taking a bath. It was just like something that purged him of everything. And he just felt enlightened and heartened. And he wrote in the margin of that book, "Sole fide." We are saved by the grace of God and we appropriate it through faith. It is the pathway to our salvation is we affirm in faith what we already have. And that is the grace of God. Now, Wesley. Wesley came home from his stint in the New World a miserable failure. He was sent to Old Tharp's community, which was sort of an early Fox and Jacobs community. <laughs> and he was lured there with the promise uh, that he could be a missionary to the Indians. Well, when Wesley got there, there wasn't an Indian within 600 miles. <laughs> and so he was dissatisfied with that, and he was, had all sorts of other problems, and he literally had to escape. And there was I shouldn't tell you this, but there was a warrant out for his arrest in Georgia. It's still there, by the way. It's still unserved, but if the person ever goes back to Georgia, they're going to arrest him. <laughs> he jumped on a boat, and he goes back to London. He gets there, his absolute faith was at a low end. And he was walking around and somebody in there started said, Oh, Wesley, you're back. He said, Yeah. He said, Well, why don't you tonight go to the Auger game with us? We're going to study New Luther's notes on Romans. And Wesley didn't have anything better to do, so he went. Now I'm going to tell you something about Luther's notes on Romans. If you have trouble sleeping, <laughs> get a copy of Luther's notes on Romans. <laughs> And start reading. Before you read two pages, you will be in a coma. <laughs> but Wesley sat there and listened. And all of a sudden, he said he felt his heart strangely warm. He began to feel the grace of God. He began to feel the salvation. He began to feel the healing that was there. And then he got to that place. It says we are saved by grace through faith. And he began to try to package that so that we can understand it because he observed there were forms of grace that help us move through the invitation from God. But the first one is provenient grace. We all have that. He had that he designed this salvation house, he said. Provenient grace which you have is the invitation to come to the house and it gets you on the porch. And while you're on the porch then, but you're not in the house yet, you're at the door, but then there is justifying grace which you accept the invitation and you come into the house and accept that invitation from God to be inside. And once you're in the house, there are many rooms to explore and that's called sanctification. Sanctifying grace. 
And he made that comment in this that says, Yeah, in that moment, in that very twinkling of an eye, when you say, Jesus is my Lord, then you are made perfect. The problem is, you take a breath, and then you sin again. <laughs> so you have to constantly be on the road to perfection, on the road to salvation. And you explore that, what it means as you move through life, what it means to lead a pious and holy life and perfect a holy life. Now, are we always saved? Are we always healed? No. Sometimes we are, sometimes not. But we are constantly aware of God's grace as always has that invitation. And by the way, Wesley also said, faith without works is a deadly faith. You have to do works of piety, works of kindness, as evidence, as evidence of your faith. Now, what are we talking about? What is holy work? Uh, I've mentioned Rabbi Lee Holder, which a friend, or he was a professor at Perkins, and. Uh, I had inherited him, my, my dad. It was when they used to play golf together, and then I came, and that's so why I kind of inherited right away over there. And I was under taking Old Testament under Bill Power, and so I get caught up in some things once in a while. And I was assigned this paper on Elijah's fiery chariot ride to heaven. You remember the story? He had this seminary student that just was constantly with him. And, Elijah was trying to get away from him. He said, well, I'm going up here, so I'll go with you. He said, well, I'm going down here on the night. He said, well, he said, I'll go with you. He said, why don't you just, well, no, okay. So the student followed him down to the river, and Elijah walked over and took off his mantle. He popped the water, and it solidified. He went across. As soon as he stepped on the other side, he went back to being river and left the student on the other side. <coughs> Then, all of a sudden, this chariot, fiery chariot, came down and picked up Elijah and takes him off. His mantle comes floating back down for the student. Now, that's the story. Now, what do I do with that? What does it mean to take a fiery chariot right to heaven? So, I go to Sir Graham. I said, Grandma, what about this? He said, well, let me tell you a story. That's what he always did. Let me tell you a story. A lot of times he'd tell me the story, and I would say, that didn't have anything to do with what I asked you. He said, yeah, but was it a good story? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the story he told about that. He said, well, once there was a Lithuanian Jew. Now, a Lithuanian Jew is a Jew's Jew. They know all the rituals. They know all the purification rituals by heart. They are just absolute Jew's Jew. And this guy was exploring one day, and he ended up down in the ghetto. And he was just appalled by the vermin and all the things that were going on there. And he was just sort of reeling from that. And he, he found himself in a wine shop with a bunch of seminary students. And they were sitting around, and he said, how do you guys stand it here? It's nasty here. The vermin and everything is horrible. How do you stand it? He said, ah. Oh, because we have a rabbi that goes to heaven every day. But, now, he's talking to a Lithuanian junior. He's talking about Moses didn't even make it. But he has a rabbi that goes to heaven every day? He said, how can that be? He said, well, we'll prove it to you. So you come with us this evening. So as evening fell, they took the Lithuanian Jew to the rabbi's house. And they smuggled him into his bedroom and hid him under the bed. And there he passed the time of day by humming hymns and singing prayers. So you, you know it's a story now, right? So he's under the bed and waiting for the dawn. And the dawn comes, he peeks out from the bed, and the rabbi gets up and goes over to a cupboard, takes out some rope, an axe, and a bag, and leaves. The Lithuanian Jew follows him. He follows him as he goes out into the forest. And when he gets into the edge of the forest, he stops with the axe and he chops some wood. 
he bundles it up with the rope. And he puts the bundle over his back, and he has the sack and the bundle and the act. He goes deeper and deeper into the woods. He comes to an old ransacked shack. And the Lithuanian Jew goes up where he can listen and see what's going on. And the Lithuanian Jew goes up where he can see inside the window. And the rabbi knocks on the door. And the voice from within says, Who is it? Because it's it's a gift, a gift of food. But I can't feed myself. I'll feed you. But I have no fire to cook it. I will blow the fire. So, but I have no one to prepare the food. And the rabbi says, I will prepare the food. Well, then the Lithuanian Jew watches as the rabbi goes in, builds a fire, takes food out of the sack, and cooks it. Takes the bowl over and kneels down by the bed of this very frail woman. And he begins to feed her. And the Lithuanian Jew leaves. Finds himself back in the same wine shop the next day with the seminary students. Ah, you're back. Yeah. Did you follow the rabbi? Yes. Didn't we tell you to? Didn't you go to heaven every day just like we told you? He said, no, no. He went higher. He went higher. You see, the charge of being faith, the understanding of God's grace, is to go higher. It's to accept our responsibility to ourselves and others in works of piety and grace. You see, it's, it's always a puzzle. Why do we have that marvelous gift? It's there. I, I, I was doing it there thing for Methodist men group out on one of the big ranches out on which side of Wichita Falls. And we went out there at a, at a bunkhouse and the men cooked tenderloin and they ate and we played guitar and sang and then after everybody was hungry and ready to go to sleep, it was my turn. And so I stood up before them and just before I got up they said, and first we'll have the devotion. And the man got out to do the devotion. And he said, and we happen to use that scripture. And he said, you know, every time I read that, it reminds me, when I used to plow at home, one side of where I would turn, make my turn to plow in the field, I went by the river. And there, the wild honeysuckle was so sweet. That every time I would make a turn, I would look forward to go by and I'd smell that wonderful honeysuckle. He says, when I hear that scripture, it's like I'm back there plowing by the, by the river. And I smell that wonderful smell. And a wonderful feeling comes over me. Well, that is the gift that we acknowledge. And why? Why we can't hang on to that, I don't know. It seems like we have forgotten that the night the Christ child came, a blind man stirred in his sleep and gleamed in his seat. We've forgotten that at night a lame man stirred in his sleep and dreamed that his legs were straight. We have forgotten that the night the Christ child came, a woman in the street stirred in her sleep and dreamed that she was pure. The night the Christ child came, a leper stirred in his sleep and dreamed that he was clean. The healing that is available to us has always been there. It's God's grace, and we appropriate that through faith. And evidence of that appropriation is that we do works of piety and good works. Well, in the World War II, the German army was moving moving towards Russia. And it was a devastating thing for the people of Russia. And they knew the army was coming and they knew what was, when that wave hit, the violence and the destruction. And so they tried to, wanted to evacuate their children. And the only escape route away from the invading army was across the frozen Volga River. 
And so they gathered up flatbed trucks and carts and donkey carts and everything else and loaded the children on them and were sending them across the river. And as they were leaving, with tears in their eyes, they would run alongside these conveyances and they would shout to the children, remember your name. Remember your name, because if you remember your name, you'd be able to reunite it when the war is over. Remember your name. My request to you today is always remember your name. Jesus is our species. We're saved by God's grace through faith. And we get evidence of this in mission to others. Oh, what about the problematic? What does it mean to be saved? Well, when you no longer feel guilty about the past because you understand the nature of forgiveness, that's the whole part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you no longer are anxious about your future because we know that's in God's hands and Jesus says, don't worry about it. What's out there that you're moving towards is good. When you are so busy in works, good works, that satisfy and thrill everyone, you are no longer dissatisfied with the present. And when we love, remember what the greatest commandment that Jesus gave? That you love one another as I have loved you. And so because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you no longer feel guilty, you're no longer anxious, you're no longer, you're no longer dissatisfied, and you love, then you are saved. That's your name. Remember it. You are the body of Christ. Amen. Yeah.